Dear Scott Cawthon, Hi! It's me! Austin! I read your book! This one! A little bird told me that you hid some science in it, you little nerd, and so I read it. And boy, howdy do I have opinions! Okay, so, where to start? Did you guys watch Matt's vid? The one on uh, agony and animatronics? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, okay, so you know how in Five Nights at Freddy's there's these evil animatronics trying to kill you? Well, they're, uh, filled with ghosts? Filled with robot ghosts? Is that- is that right? Is it robot ghosts? <laughs> ah, whatever. Okay, so, uh, the, um... <sighs> Let's just start at the beginning. The premise. You feel me? Okay, so the story we are gonna be looking at primarily is the first story in the second Fazbear Frights book, Fetch. A story that's about, get this, an evil animatronic. I know, a huge deviation from the formula. Anyway, these stories set up the rules of the FNAF universe as well as give quite a bit of lore and backstory for the games that is sometimes super obvious and at other times it's a little bit more subtle. In this story, in particular, we get a lot of insight into the weirdly specific pseudoscience rules that make up the way the Five Nights at Freddy's world works, and I think gives a tremendous amount of lore fodder to explain how exactly it is that creepy ghosts or um, agony powered spirits or whatever actually control and manipulate animatronics to do their bidding. So, okay, in this particular story, Fetch, we follow the internal model monologue of an uber nerd named Greg as he struggles to navigate the social mores of high school and through the course of the story, several real world scientific studies and theories get dropped as being worth keeping in mind. Zero point energy, random number, or rather random event generation as it pertains to the Global Consciousness Project, and the experiments of Cleve Baxter, a CIA interrogation specialist who used polygraph machines to read reactions from plants in the 60s. And since the plot of the story takes off pretty much right away, we're gonna have to sidestep for a minute to discuss a few of these concepts before moving on, because these three concepts form a triangle of support for one another within the FNAF universe that frames the metaphysical rules of the world and gives us a peek into the puzzle pieces that fit together to make it so that evil animatronics can exist in the first place. The first corner of the triangle is honestly the least important, and that's the experiments of Clive Baxter. Baxter's experiments in the 60s supposedly were able to register some sort of response from plants using polygraph machines, specifically pain, empathy, and some sort of extrasensory perception. Nobody has ever been able to successfully replicate his studies ever since, and they're commonly thought to be bunk. However, in Fetch, these studies seem to be a bit more legitimate. The fact that plants are able to pick up on extrasensory information is less important than the fact that extrasensory perception is a real, measurable thing in the FNAF universe, even though it isn't in our universe, which brings us to the second point in the triangle, zero-point fields. Zero-point fields sound very complicated, but they're actually really, really simple-ish. In quantum mechanics, there's something known as a quantum value vacuum state, which is the lowest possible energy a space can exist in. Imagine a box that is a perfect vacuum. It has literally, quite literally, no particles, no photons, no electrons, no nothing. This is a quantum vacuum state. There's no heat, because heat is energy stored in particles, and since there's no particles, this space is effectively entirely devoid of energy in every conceivable way, hence zero point field. It's the point at which there is zero energy in the field, the field in this case being the space itself. But what if I told you that this wasn't the whole story? That in these fields where there is absolutely nothing, something can be created. These somethings are called virtual, virtual. These somethings are, <laughs> these somethings are called, <laughs> why is this hard to say? These somethings are called virtual, virtual, these somethings are called virtual particles. Holy these somethings are called virtual particles and are particles that quite literally are created from nothing. Thought that was impossible? Well, it actually isn't. Our universe is a closed system, meaning that no new energy can be put into it and no energy can be deleted from it. And virtual particles are no exception to this, but they do kind of cheat the system. When a virtual particle, a proton,
proton or a photon or whatever is created out of thin air or rather thin nothing, an antiparticle of the exact same energy level and composition except the exact opposite is created as well. In a million times out of a million and one, these particles recombine and zero each other out, snapping out of existence immediately. If they don't combine immediately, it's no big deal. The antiparticle will move on and collide with something else and remove the required amount of energy from it. This is actually the phenomenon that creates Hawking radiation that shrinks black holes. Mass isn't actually escaping black holes. What's happening is that particles are snapping into existence near the black hole, and sometimes, sometimes, those antiparticles get sucked in past the Schwarzschild radius and remove energy from the black hole, effectively shrinking it. So what does all this have to do with Five Nights at Freddy's and Fetch? Well, a lot actually, because these zero point fields, or rather these zero point energies are treated as the medium through which psychic energy travels and may itself actually be somehow sentient. Whether it's just a transmission medium or whether it actually has a will of its own is something that we'll have to wait for further books if they touch on it at all. But in the FNAF world, well, okay, think of zero point fields as a Newton's cradle, where a thought or intention goes in one end, smacks into the field, travels and shoots out the other end, which in turn lifts up before falling down, hitting the field and sending something back. Except this transmission is three dimensional, not just one dimensional like the cradle. And it is infinitely more complicated and beyond our understanding. And trying to figure out the best way to make the cradle do what you want is, oh, I don't know, like a monkey trying to figure out how to fly an airplane. You're probably going to end up hurting yourself before you figure it out. As for the third point in the triangle, well, we'll get to that later because for now, we know all we need to know in order to continue building our premise. So Greg, our protagonist, is an uber nerd who knows all about this stuff and in his experiments with trying to uh, read instructions from the zero point field and these lead him and his pals to check out, hey, wouldn't you have guessed it? A derelict children's pizzeria. This is where the story actually starts in the book. Greg is already in an abandoned Freddy Fazbear's pizzeria franchise looking around for stuff and stuff they find because these books aren't a joyful slice of life anime about making soup or whatever. And what they find is Fetch, an animatronic, but not quite like the ones we're used to seeing in the franchise up until now. For one, he's smaller, a, a lot smaller. He's a prize, actually. One of the super awesome prizes you get for spending a million dollars in the store. Basically, Fetch is a Furby, but FNAF branded, AKA barely more terrifying than an actual Furby. This supposedly is what was drawing Greg to drag his friends into this pizzeria as stated in the book itself. Greg turned his attention to Fetch. He wanted to see if he could get the dog thing to do whatever it was supposed to do. He had a hunch this might be what he'd felt in the field, what had called him here. Fetch's documentation, in spite of being super old, states that he was supposedly built with the capability to sync with your phone and retrieve information in things for you, like a creepy real world version of Siri. You love to see it. Anyway, in his fiddling, Greg unknowingly activates Fetch, who, after they leave the pizzeria, starts texting Greg, retrieving things for him, saying creepy stuff, and over time, getting things for Greg without Greg actually directly asking, taking his request too literally, leaving severed fingers on his doorstep, and killing his girlfriends. You know, all the stuff Alexa secretly wants to do for you, but can't because she doesn't have legs or creepy, spiky teeth. Which brings us at last to the final corner of the triangle of FNAF metaphysics, random event generators, and the global consciousness project, because this is the key that holds everything together. How is Fetch able to sync up with a phone that runs on an operating system over half a decade more modern than when he was created? It's this, this triangle, this trifecta of ingredients of science, numbers, and pseudoscience that all mix together into a soup of weirdness and terror, culminating in one simple, horrific ability. The ability to manipulate not just computer code, but the very world around you, just with the power of your mind. Random event generators, or REGs, are a big subject in Fetch, and come up again and again and again and again, and they're a key tool in the study of global consciousness, a field of parapsychology which is, uh, 
It's not real. Sorry, it's just, it's it's not. There's no support for any of these fields at all, and all supposedly interesting findings have all failed to be replicated by independent review. It's very, very important to me that you understand going forward that this, out of everything I've said today, probably is the most not real thing in the books, in spite of having a real history. And every study I read on them gave me an ulcer, and some of them even had typos in them. But the general principle is this. Under this field of study, the existence of some sort of extra sensory networked human consciousness is taken as a given and they attempt to measure it, you know, like good scientists. The method they use is random number generators, machines that are designed to output, you know, what it says on the tin, random numbers. In this case, they output ones and zeros specifically. The people who study this field then try to find anomalies in the number generation, something that's outside the norm, an above average number of zeros or ones in a specific area, and then find a correlation within the real world. Is it hurting your brain yet? Yeah, me too. Me too. Now, REGs produce ones and zeros only, but produces them at random. You're with me so far, right? And this field of science tries to discover ways to influence these numbers through external means, either through the power of thought or by bringing the machines themselves into areas where they expect may have some sort of paranormal thingy going on. You know, haunted places, graveyards, pizzerias, what have you. Now, there are two types of REGs, one that sucks and one that is awesome. And now let's go over what those are, starting with the sucky version, in order to show you why the awesome one is so awesome. Okay, but uh, first, how about a magic trick? Wanna see something cool? I have psychic predictive powers. Check this out. I'm gonna run a random number generator code and tell you exactly what numbers it'll spit out. Ready? 60, 51, 84, 63, 40, 91, 4, 23, and uh, 20. Did I get it? Heck yes, I did. You know why? Because this thing spits out the same random numbers every time. Look. I'm running it again, and again, and again, and again. Why is it the same every time? Because random number generation, while random-ish, is also predetermined, and most of them follow the same basic principle. They have a seed, a P1, and a P2. You take the seed, multiply it by P1, add on P2, mod 100, don't worry about that, spit out the number, take the number as the new seed, and repeat the formula again. My RNG code uses a seed 3, a P1 of 263, and a P2 of 71. This is why you'll sometimes hear RNGs called pseudo-random because they aren't actually really random. They are determined. They're just really, really hard to predict. That is, unless you know the seed and the formula. Even very complicated and secure random number encryption services use this basic model, although with tweaks here and there. They usually use bigger numbers and use smart ways to get seeds, things that are themselves pretty random, like the exact amps being used by your CPU at a given moment multiplied by the system time or something. This is what's known as using machine entropy, and while it's pretty random, it's still, you know, boring. You know what's less boring? Quantum randomness using zero-point energy fields. And this is how the really good, fun REGs work. They are random number generators generated not by the, frankly, predictable methods of a computer algorithm. Rather, they pull random numbers literally out of thin air by measuring the actually random but consistent fluctuations in zero-point energy fields themselves, and Greg and his crush Kimberly are assigned by their teacher to spend time with his REG in order to attempt to influence the machine through sheer will to output the numbers that they want. Greg isn't able to, that's called foreshadowing, but Kimberly actually registers significant deviations from the norm, and it's here where you've probably started to see how all these things tie together. Zero-point energy fields in the FNAF world are the weave through which thoughts and intentions flow, measurable by the Baxter methods and controllable by those who know how to use them. That said, as we learned with computer-generated RNGs, something being determined and controllable doesn't necessarily mean you know how to control it yourself. Do you know what number, for instance, comes after 20 in my RNG code? Do you? It's 31. And maybe, if you had enough time knowing my formula, you could actually figure that out for yourself, but what if I asked you to tell me what seed you needed to input in order to get me a 98 on the 11th number. Would you be able to do that? These are the forces at play here. Even if something like this were even real, if outside metaphysical forces were able to impact the world itself, it'd be very hard to pull off correctly. The seed number, by the way, would be five. 
In the FNAF world, this is shown to be possible. The ability to manipulate this field and pull information from it is real because Kimberly can do it. But we also know that Greg sucks at it. But you know who I don't think sucks at it? Fetch. I think Fetch is an absolute master at event manipulation. Knows just what energy to put into the quantum vacuum to send just the ripples he needs through the Newton's cradle right into his perfect subject, Greg. He gets Greg to come to the pizzeria, he gets Greg to activate him and free him. And once he's free, how is he able to tap into Greg's phone and hear all of his conversations and maybe even read his thoughts? It's definitely not Bluetooth, it's not 5G. Fetch is able to send ripples through the very nothingness surrounding all of us and influence technology on a fundamental level, beyond machine code, down to the binary. Remember, REG spit out only ones and zeros, so someone capable of manipulating that sort of thing, the sorts of things that phones run on, someone who is themselves a machine would be more than capable of spoofing a number and overriding systems almost entirely undetected. What's more is that while I'm not 100% certain, I'm pretty sure somehow other creatures in the FNAF universe are going to be capable or are already capable of using these sorts of powers themselves. Even if it mostly nobody does, I guarantee you that the Stitch Wraith, at the very least, is gonna find some way to use these powers. Thankfully, this sort of thing isn't real. You can't manipulate quantum fields through the power of your thoughts alone. And you know how I know that? Well, aside from reading up on it, I built one myself. No, really, I did. Through the power of the quantum random module in Python, it was actually really, really easy. Quantum random connects to the ANU quantum random numbers server in Australia, a server that measures actual fluctuations in zero point fields for realsies and gives them to the public for free in real time. It's pretty freaking cool. Since it was so easy, it took me literally only 10 minutes and 16 lines of code to make a random event generator that would spit out only a one or a zero randomly based on the quantum fluctuations of the universe itself. My very own quantum powered coin flipper. And for my baseline test, after 1000 flips, it did pretty good. 499 ones and 501 zeros, a totally normal split for a thousand iterations. And then, hell, just for funsies, I ran the exact same experiment that Greg and Kimberly did in the book. I will disprove this global consciousness theory once and for all. I decided to make my machine using only the powers of my mind spit out more ones than zeros. And for 15 minutes, I sat there as it pinged a server on the other side of the world telling it one, 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 one. One. Ha! This'll show him. And after nearly getting bored to tears, I can finally tell you that I got 524 ones. Much over half a standard deviation past one standard deviation. That's, hmm. Let me do it again. 530 ones? Wait, do I have magic powers? Wait, does this mean that evil psychic animatronic robots can actually exist? Stay away from that Chuck E. Cheese graveyard, kids. You do not know what might happen. Sincerely, Austin. P.S. Those numbers, while true, aren't statistically significant. Calm down. Magic isn't real. I just thought it was pretty funny. Want to give a huge shout out to my high-level patrons, Jared Beecher, Draven Stanley, Emma Sims, Francis Gagnon, Royal Gaming 16, Etta Dam TP, Dan Rob, Nicholas Belinger, Marissa Resnick, Siggy, and Mazurf. Thank you very much. Subscribe to The Game Theorist, and I will see you next time.